Welcome all. I'm here with Chris Akabuzi. Is that how you pronounce your name? Yeah, that's, that, that will work, Johannes. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Chris Akabuzi works. Yeah, for sure. Great. So it's a, it's a pleasure that you're here. We met very briefly in February when we were still allowed to go outside when you came to a talk I gave on death of all topics. And ever since we've been in Twitter exchanges and you left a lot of very insightful comments on my YouTube channel. So I thought I'd bring you on and we'll talk about philosophy. That's amazing. And thank you very much, Johannes. And I've been enamored of your work. And um, it's great to actually uh, meet, meet you in person. And um, yeah, I'm encouraged that um, you think that, you know, I've got something decent to say. I mean, I, I, you know, I love philosophy. I've been reading philosophy for quite a while. Um, yeah. But um, it's a privilege to be on your channel and to be able to contribute to classical philosophy. Privilege to have you. What, what is it that got you into philosophy and what do you read? So I, I thought about this question when I was, when I, when I was coming on. And yeah. the question, you know, what got me into philosophy? And what I've got to say is that in the UK, I, I know you've got a national audience, international audience. But in, an, in the UK, I'm known as, as a sportsman. Yeah, um, I, I competed for uh, my country, Great Britain, from 1983 to 1992. Yeah, um, Olympic silver medalist, world champion, European champion, Commonwealth champion. So I've got this catalogue of medals that I've won as a sportsman, and I've gone on to make my name as a as a speaker, a conference speaker, a television personality. I'm very seen, very much as, as a zany, um, larger than life character. But all along, I've been reading philosophy. Yeah. And I asked myself the question, why did I get into existential philosophy? What was it that drew me to Nietzsche yes. in the man, Heidegger? And what I realized is that ever since I was a young man, a young lad, there were these underlying questions that puzzled me. I'm absolutely amazed that I'm here. Yeah. It, 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 it just bowls me over that I'm alive. Yeah. Because it doesn't have to be. I don't have to be here. I don't have to be in the world. And yet I'm here. And so the challenge for me was, why am I here? Who am I? How ought I to be? And then as you go along, you, you notice, and you, as you said, I met you at a, a seminar you was given around death. Yes. It surrounds us this thing called death. Yeah. So then you begin to understand, whoever I am, why, whatever I'm here, that too passes. And on this horizon, I will surely die. Now, I know we try to hide it up and cover it up. Yeah. But in good French, après moi, what? And so these are the questions that, 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 that I struggle with. When I die, what? Is it nothingness? Total oblivion? <laughs> the, the, the place where we've, you know, where I'm surprised I come from because this doesn't have to be? Or yeah. is there some form of transcendence? And so yeah. these are the questions that I've, been, that I've been grappling with all my life, and I've had different answers along the way. Yeah. You know, um, I had a very strong period of Christianity yes. from 87 to 97. But these are the real fundamental questions. And, and what I like about existential philosophy is that it's not theoretical, it's not analytical, it's not ivory tower. It's, 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 it's here. It's, there's a, there's a viscosity to it. Yes. There's, there's a, a grittiness to it. And there's an everydayness to it. Yes. Yeah. And you mentioned Heidegger. I know you, you know Heidegger's, you began Heidegger. What I like about Heidegger is the way that he disrupted the normal patterns of language. Yes. Using, you know, Words, just as words, glossalia, and he stopped and got us thinking 
and I'm sure the words will come out, words are like, like Dasein and Dasman and, yeah. and, and Glassenheit and Gestell, to get us really, really thinking what's behind these words. Yes, exactly. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, you speak German. I think people should know this. Um, yeah, which is, yeah, fortunately, yes. Because, yeah. you know, I, I, Heidegger said one can only philosophize in ancient Greek and German. And when I said this to a friend, when I came to the UK eight years ago, I said this to a, uh, an English friend of mine, and he said, how convenient. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, uh, but it's true what you say about language. Is that what Heidegger asks us to do is something very akin to a similar to what Osset Mandelstam uh, did, who was a, a Russian writer and poet in the early 20th century, who, who says that, you know, everyday speech is automatic. And yes. what poetic speech does is it interrupts the word. And there's a wonderful quote by Osset Mandelstam, which I can only paraphrase, where he says, you know, when we say the word sun, it's not a signifier. Saying the word sun takes us on a journey to the sun. It takes us to the sun itself. And that's what poetry reminds us of. And Goethe says something similar. He says, you know, in everyday dealings, we get along just fine with our cliched uh, language. But then when something deeper is at stake, that's when another language comes in, and that's poetic language. And I think that's what Heidegger brings into philosophy. Yeah, 100%. And, and, you know, you said it almost in jest, you know, Greek and German, but, but actually I, I, I believe that in as much as my, I was introduced to German yeah. when I was 17, 18, 19. And this is a period when you are leaving your home of origin yeah. and starting anew. And so there are words that I know in German that have no equivalent in English. Exactly, yeah. And when I say that word in German, <laughs> before still, the pictures in my mind, they're not there in English. So, yes. so, so I'm thinking about this again t today. As a German word, I mean, I just love the sound of this word. It's not for this <laughs> word. Yeah. There's a word called unausstehlich. Yeah. Now, the word unausstehlich, I do not know what that means in English. I know, so, but, but unausstehlich, to me, when I hear that word, it means that I cannot stand in the presence of whatever it is, and that in this combative environment, this thing wins. I cannot stand in its presence. Sooner or later, I have to move away. It's all our daily. And there's no word for that in English. <laughs> there just isn't a word. And so when you take that into the philosophical realm, yeah. and you hear something like, das man. It, it, well, actually, isn't the word in English. Yes, there, there isn't. That, that's, that's, it's problematic. And what you just said, what you very uh, vis visually uh, showed here is that the, the difference between the German and the English vernacular is profound. Uh, the English language is very descriptive. So the English language can describe an object to bits. And, and, that's, just, and that's just reflected also in, in the, just in a pure quantity in terms of the amount of, of the amount of words that there are, then adjectives upon adjectives. I mean, it, that's a bit dying now because people just say very or really, really great. Uh, instead of magnificent or splendid. And there's so many wonderful adjectives in the English language. Uh, but what the German language is fundamentally, it's spatial temporal. And you know this, right? So unausstehlich, that's, mm. that's stehen, which means to stand. The yes. Licht turns it into an adjective, and the un is the an or the, the privative. So, you know, it, you, you stand there, but you can't, cannot stand there. And you use, you use the German word Vorstellung, which is in English imagination or representation, but also introduction, which literally means to place something before oneself. Yes. Um, and it's, so it's, it's always playing with spatial temporal dimensions. And, and, and Brilliant. That's, Brilliant. That's where it is. And what Heidegger does with Das Mann, of, in English, of course, we can say, you know, Oh, they, they, I think they're repairing the streetlights. Who are they? Uh, no, or you, or, you know, oh, as you know, the, the upper classes will say one. Oh, one was very kind. 
uh, etc. But it's it's not quite the same because the the German man is is so pervasive, so prevalent. You lived in Germany. It's so prevalent in how how Germans speak. Is that not sorry? Man macht das nicht. Man macht das yeah, nicht. yeah, exactly. So it can be very normative, but it can also be to, to hide in a certain anonymity. One can be anonymous in das man. And, and Heidegger, yeah, so what, what Heidegger really does is he uses, you know, especially in the later philosophy, it's just he, he comes back to simple words, but then, as you say, shows us how much is at stake in these simple words. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. So, so, so you, you know, I, I think that is what drew me to German philosophers. Yeah, it's a language. It's a, it's a language. Yeah, it's a language. Yeah. You know, so, 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 so Nietzsche, Heidegger, a little bit into to Jasper's and his limit situations. Yeah, but it's the language. So, so I, I have fallen for existentialism, but not so much Sartre in point of view. Yeah. Because I, I, I'm not into the French language. You know, I'm into the German. Yeah. And the, the, the German sort of 19th century, maybe even 18th century, 19th century, early 20th century, was a very powerful house for philosophical thinking and discourse. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you know, I, I'm very much at home in the world with German, German, German thinking, German philosophers. What is it about Nietzsche, though, that draws you in? What I loved, well, what I love about Nietzsche, yeah, is that Nietzsche has given me permission to start all over again. Um, That's he's radical. Uh, um, he he takes no prisoners. Yeah. Um, what you can see when you read Nietzsche, you know, love him or hate him. This is a guy who's going to stand on his on his vibe, yeah. on what he sees, and he's he's. I mean, many times I find myself categorized in the herd, yeah, because I see myself many many times too scared to stand out and go with, go against the flow. But but Nietzsche is not afraid, and so. I came to Nietzsche, and it, with all the cliches, you know, um, yeah. what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's all the cliches that every, everyone knows. Yeah. But once you start reading him, and he and he says, "See, Nietzsche, you can always anyone can take Nietzsche out of context, but he says to you, read me properly, read me thoroughly, read me over and over again." And then don't worship me. Find the you in me and find your own way. So it's the idea that Nietzsche wants to reconstruct all of the values that have gone before. Everyone knows, you know, when he says to me, the God is dead. Yeah. I'm, I'm not necessarily taking that, that he's saying, I, Nietzsche, have stepped outside and I've, I, I've, I've, I've killed all deity i think he's actually what he does often he says he looks at the culture he says i'll look at you and if there was a god you don't know him yes there's nothing in you that's appealing to some sort of great alpha and omega and yet you live as if he's not there and yet you live as can i say he as if he is there all yeah. of your structures all of your laws everything you do is in abeyance to a God who no longer exists in your, in your, in, in, in your life. And so he, he, he wants to challenge all that and say, if there is no God, then this is what it means. Yeah. You are alone in this world. Yeah, yeah. Radically alone, yeah. Radically <laughs> alone in, in this world. And all of your mores, all of your values are nothing. Yeah. Are meaningless. And so, although I was interested because... I've only just started reading The Will to Power because, and, and funnily enough, you were one of the people that got me into looking at it because I'd always thought the Naklas, the, 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 the Naklas is the, the, the work that he left after he died. I always thought I'd been tampered with by his, his, his sister, Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche, and um, 
you know, he didn't really construct it and it's little bits of the notes that he scribbled on the pieces of paper and yeah. the people really constructed the real to power out of it. And so I'd not really gone there. But um, I just started reading that with the real to power and trying to think what my point, why I've gone there. Because there, because there, there is a, a more of a coherence and a system to the, the that, that book will to power, yeah. Um, and where he, all of the stuff that he's done from um, you know, um, birth of tragedy, uh, all the way through beyond good and evil. I mean, I love, I love, I love, I love Fastbox, so Strusser, for example. I love that book. If yeah. a poet, the philosophical book. I love that book. Um, all comes to together in the world of power, even though I know that he, he, he didn't write it. It's all from his fragments. I'm not quite sure why I was going there. There was a reason why I was going there. I often do this. I get myself so excited that I lose myself in it. Yes. I think with the will to power, it's, there are when you read, the, so um, I have the, the German Gesamtausgabe, the collected works up, up there somewhere, and it's, it's 15 volumes. Uh, more than half of those are the Nachlass, the unpublished works. Yeah. And the unpublished notebooks are Nietzsche at his, at his finest. It's where you see someone think. Uh, there are incredible thoughts in there. He's very, he's very prescient about our age. I'll, I'll mention something in a bit. And he actually does work on the will to power again and again. He comes back to the title. He sets it all up. And then, of course, he loses it. Uh, he mm -hmm. loses the plot in his last year uh, when mm -hmm. he spent most of the time in Torino and then collapses. Mm -hmm. Um, in early January. Hold on, Johannes, Johannes. So, so, yeah. so, so, because so, I, I, so, what you're saying, so from 83 to 88, he was working on his Nachlass. Is that what you're saying? Or, or so he, you now know his Nachlass? No, what is he, the, the, the Nachlass, I think, begins in, so the, in 1869. That, that's when the Nachlass begins. So, it, it's, it's just his, his notes from, from, from almost his entire life. Oh, I see. Um, so the Nachlass is volumes upon volumes. You can, you can read first drafts of Beyond Good and Evil in there. And he says things that are not, so for example, Nietzsche is considered a philosopher of nihilism mm -hmm. uh, or someone who, he does talk that much about nihilism in his published works actually, but he does in the Nachlass. In the Nachlass, for example, he says that the moral hypothesis of, of Christianity and Platonism was a bulwark against nihilism. But now the uncanny guest is at our doorstep. Heidegger quotes this very often that that the world, uh, that nihilism is an uncanny guest. The actually the unheimlichste guest, the most uncanny yes. guest of all. And he speaks of an uncanny real work, an unheimliches Räderwerk, which will be the history of the next two hundred years. People now speak of a rat race, as you know, and. So that, that life is reduced, that we're reduced to wheels in a, uh, uh, in, in a wheel work, it's cocks in, in, a, in a machine. Nietzsche sees all of that. And so much of this is in the Nachlass. Um, so you can, you, you can find that there. And, and so the Will to Power is this book that, that was to some degree put together, I think, by his sister, yes. Uh, but, but, but there will be, the most passages will be in the Nachlass. Yeah, and so, so we, you, you use the word unheimlich and then yeah. the word canny. And again, so this is one of those German words that I don't think translates into English. Uh, and I don't understand, I'm probably wrong because I'm not the great, uh, greatest English exposition, but I don't think the word uncanny does it for yeah. me. You see, when I hear the word unheimlich, First, we need to understand, the English people listening, Heimlich is that sense of being at home, that sense of being comfortable in your surroundings, that sense of actually, I belong here, I'm at one here, this is where I belong. That, 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 but so, unheimlich is the sense of, it's a foreboding, it's a, oh, where am I, who am I? What's happening next? It's, you, know, you know, there's so much being, being communicated in the word unheimlich. Uncanny doesn't do it. Uncanny doesn't what, do it for me. What would be a word in English? Would it, could, 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 probably unhomely isn't the word, is it? No, but, that, but, 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 
well, the, the descriptor is not feeling at home in the world. Yeah. That is it. But yeah. there isn't a word for yeah. not feeling at home in the world. I've seen it interpreted uncanny. It doesn't do it now. What, what, it does it, what does uncanny sound like to your ear when you hear uncanny without the unheimlich? What does it mean? If you describe uncanny, it. Well, 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 the word canny, yeah. canny sounds, so the word canny, or oh, canny is, oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. It's not nice then, yeah. yeah. It, it's a, it, it's a, it would be shun. Say shun. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, 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 but say shun's got nothing to do with, with Heimlich. Yes, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, I mean, that's, it's very important to point this out how much often there's lost in, then in translation when actually when, it, when the original would say unheimlich and then yes. we speak of uncanny, what's being lost is that what Nietzsche actually means is that this utter sense, as you put it, this utter sense of homelessness, that exactly. all of a sudden the world closes in on you and yes. you're no longer home in it. And you, there's no, you find no stance, right? You find nothing. Kind of help on, kind of fest help on. You're not, you're not, you know, you, you're unstable. Everything that held you, your whole yeah. ground of being, the yes. whole circumference, everything is ripped away. If you rip away the idea of God, everything is ripped away. But then you want to put in front of you, sorry. So this pushing, to, this is important, right? So when you say it like this, that this utter disappearance of any sense of home, and then Nietzsche brings this together with our economy, literally, with the economic, a planetary economic system. And he actually says, uh, what's inevitably, this is a quote, what's inevitably in store for us is the total economic management of the earth. Mm -hmm. That's what he says in the same passage in the unpublished um, notes that we just quoted. And there he says this unheimliche Räderwerk. So this Räderwerk, this real work, gives us a hold, a stance to hold on to somehow, but not really. It doesn't really make us home in the world. That's why it's unheimlich. Because it, yeah. it gives us something to hold on to, but it at the same time makes us homeless. It does the opposite of what it's supposed to do when you find the stance in beings, right? Yes, 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 yeah, yeah exactly. And, 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 and this question, this ability that he had, because I, I think there is also a sense in, in Will of Power where he, he's looking over the next 200 years. Exactly. Yes, he's, always. He's, he's, always. This is our time. Yes, no, oh, yes. And you read him, and you know, this is, I mean, so when I was taught Nietzsche at school, it was like, oh, let's read the madman and he's a nihilist and blah, blah, blah. And it took me years to, uh, to understand after school, I'm 16 or 17, that, that, that Nietzsche is, that, when you read the madman in the gay science, that's where he um, mm -hmm. introduces or speaks of the death of God. Exactly. Th th that's not a triumph. He's no. not, it's not a triumphant cry um, uh, or, or a triumphant speech. It's actually, it's devastating when you read it, right? The entire horizon has been wiped oh, away with, with drowning in, in a void. And yes, yeah. And he always talks about the next 200 years because I think for Nietzsche, and he's very, when you take him seriously, and I think right now, this is a weird time to have this conversation because it, it, it seems that people are more receptive now to taking philosophy actually literally and seriously that's something i always say to people just take literally right because what we do is oh that's just that's a nice that's an interesting metaphor mm -hmm. right no no no. just the cave is real that, that's the first thing you have to understand and and then every philosophy after the cave allegory always asks how can we leave the cave mm -hmm. that's always the question and for nietzsche the question really is what will be the next 200 years this is why he comes up with the ubermensch Mm -hmm. as a as a bridge away from what's going on now because if we keep on living the way we're used to without the ultimate horizon of god then it, it's we, we, what he calls the transvaluation of values right mm -hmm. if we are without doing that uh we, we become even more meaningless yeah so so, so, so uh, what are because a few things that you talk, that there's so many things that like that like ubermensch for example like yeah. ubermensch Eternal recurrence, and I've followed you and I've listened to you. So, Uber mentioned like to talk about eternal recurrence, I like to talk about, yeah. for no reason like that, you know, 
for my own education because I'm definitely, I'm nowhere near the finished article. I'm definitely on the way. I'm privileged to be here uh, uh, and with you. Um, so one thing that bothers me, yeah, among many things, so the word Ubermensch. So I've been recently involved in reading Thus Spark Salus Dustat and this idea of the Ubermensch. Yeah. Now, what, 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 what gets my goat at the moment is every time I see that, well, not over time, yeah. most times that I see the Ubermensch translated into English, yeah. it's Superman. And yet I cannot get from the context of the writing and the word that I know, super. You know, you know I, I, get, I get over, above, beyond. Yeah. More than exactly, even superior to yes, <laughs> but the idea that it's super, yeah, no, you yeah. demand the bridge that must be overcome and overgoing and a downgoing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, when, it, when, 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 when it comes to the to, to the marketplace, uh, there's a style of yes. that comes to the yes. marketplace, and they, there's there's a type of walker, walker, and he's overgoing somewhere, and he gets overcome by, by, the, by the, the mad guy behind him. Yes. And then he falls down. You know, so, so, so and that South he, he comes from down the mountain. So he's over and he's coming yeah. down. So, yeah. so, 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 so that's one of those, this is, this is one of those where from my sort of limited understanding, when I think of Uber, anything but Super. So yes. I'd love to see what you, what you think about that, Jonah. I, I think, so it depends on which translation you're reading. I think the newer translations often speak of Overman. Yeah, Kaufman, Overman. Kaufman oh. did Overman. Okay, Kaufman did that already. I, did, I wasn't even aware of it because I always read the, the term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, and so I have a bit of a, a, an advantage perhaps. But yes, as you say, the, the very first... Um, Prelude, uh, the very first speech of Zarathustra ends on the, on on where he said, "Also began Zarathustra's Untergang." Thus yes. began Zarathustra's downgoing, not his decline. Then you mentioned um, the, the person on the the, the road, road, the yes. tight road. Um, now this guy falls down. I've interpreted this as saying, um, "I actually I'm reading this book with a private student at the moment." So well, what I was saying to 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 him was that the trouble with, with this person is he, 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 he signifies to a certain degree this attempt to go over and beyond. But the, the finish line is already given. And it's, it's done in a way, you know, on the market square, it's too public. It's too, it's, it's, it's too staged. Therefore, it, it fails. And of course, you know, this tragic beginning on this per, this man dying mm. by falling down, everyone running away, um, is in line with what Zarathustra says about the last man, the last yes. man who flattens the earth, who yes. only lives, as he, exactly, who, who only lives for enjoyment and entertainment. So anyone who tries to go beyond mustn't do this in terms of, or in on the on like this on the terms of the spectacle. Because it always becomes a spectacle, and maybe Nietzsche is even aware of that himself, uh, that that he could become. As you know, he said, "My name will be a fate," and you don't know what kind of fate. And there's a wonderful passage in that's the one I like the most. Um, in Zarathustra is "Vom vorübergehen," which Von, actually, okay. yeah. Yeah. Which, actually yeah. which which confirms what you're saying, because yeah. here you have the, as he calls him, the ape of Zarathustra was outside the city walls, Zarathustra meets him, and he's this, the ape of Zarathustra, the, his copycat, sounds a bit like him, but is actually very cynical and um, full of hatred and full of resentment, ressentiment, and that's what Nietzsche resents, haha, pun intended. <laughs> and, uh, so Zarathustra says to him, um, wo, let me, I want to read it, because... Yeah, please, please. He said, Do not zum Abschiede. This, this I tell you, you fool, on parting. Wo man nicht mehr lieben kann, da soll man vorübergehen. 
where one can no longer love, there one shall pass by, move over and beyond. Yes. That's, I think that's the Übermensch. I think to some degree that's the Übermensch, but then also the Übermensch is, and, and that's where Nietzsche gets, you know, that, that's where Nietzsche gets a bit too much, too heavy for many, is that the world now is meaningless. Yes. That's clear for Nietzsche. That's, every, yeah. it, it's yeah. nothing with beings. Every, meaninglessness looks at us and what's bursting through, through all of it is just the will to power. Mm -hmm. Just a sheer will to power. And what the Übermensch is, is a, as he calls him in the Nahles, is, a justif is the justifying man. That means exactly. it's, it's the human being that can justify this meaninglessness and turn this meaninglessness into meaning for himself. So hold on. So, so Jan, Johannes, do you actually think that Übermensch is Mensch, is, is, is a human being, is a man? So you say, well, well, because it's a leading question. So if I put in, you see, yeah. I, I, when I read it and i say i'm very very young in the reading my perception is that the ubermensch is what comes after humanity as we know after homo sapien that the ubermensch is not homo sapien that 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 what he's asking for is rather than to be shackled by all the values and, and, and morality and, and, you know, cause you know, he's against utilitarian ethics. The greatest yeah. good of the greatest number. He's, he's, he's like, what is all that about? That's a dumbing down. You know, that's a, a, a flattening of the earth. No, he's saying, you, you know, that this come to me today about the will to power, you, you know, because I've often thought about actually, we want to survive. No, he says, the, 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 the preservation instinct is the antithesis to the will of power. And that I want, these powerful forces to keep on fighting so that it brings the Ubermensch in, so that, so that the Ubermensch is as far away from us as we are from the apes. In fact, <laughs> in fact we are more ape than the Ubermensch will be man. So that, was yeah. what I, that is what I got. D there's, there's, and I might be wrong, I might be wrong, but yeah, no. this is what, go on, go on. The only thing I would say is, the only thing, that's it's all in line with what Nietzsche says. The only thing I would say I, I would not I would not use the biological category of Homo sapiens because okay, then, yes. then well I think so it's it's I think um, so what what Nietzsche sees is the la, the last man as a, a great destroyer because he says you know we're not even capable of being sick anymore we're not even capable of of tragedy now how um, in order to we will have to begin with the gay signs. The gay signs, the fourth book, which used to be the last book, I think, then another book yes. was added to it, ends on two important paths. That's that's also the book where um, where he introduces the the death of God, mm -hmm. which is one of the teachings of Zarathustra. And Zarathustra teaches the Übermensch, but also the eternal recurrence of the same. Mm -hmm. Want to talk about that? Yeah. And he <laughs> mentions in the, in the gay science, he says, in the fröhliche Wissenschaft, right, the, the, the joyful science, how to be joyful against, not pessimistic, not optimistic, but joyful. That, that's impossible for modern, for the last man to understand that there could be something else in other optimism or pessimism. And I always say optimism is, is the worst kind of pessimism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about that maybe too. But the, what the book ends on, the fourth book of the gay science is the eternal recurrence of the same as das größte Schwergewicht, the heaviest weight. Mm. Where he introduces it, and I don't think it's, it's a thought experiment. It's in a moment in which we are floating away through the void of a no longer a cosmos, but now a bursting open uh, universe, a multiverse. What could there be that pulls us down and gives gravitas weight? to existence so that there is there can be again responsibility and that to nietzsche is the eternal recurrence of the same because then one lives according to how these moments return heidegger by the way in his nietzsche volume the first volume when he talks about the eternal recurrence of the same he makes very spooky points he says you know what what the, the science is called deja vu those are indications that we've already always already been there and this is what Nietzsche sees too, that there's something strange. That it's, got, it's got to do with memory, with you know, a, a collective memory, if you like, of what it means to be human. Um, and 
to, the Übermensch, I think, is still man, is still human. It's, it's not some machinic overpowered, but it's someone who, and Nietzsche says somewhere in the Nachlass, I think, that the, Über, the Übermensch is already amongst us. Um, and it's someone who can justify existence in this period of, 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 of transition. This is a period of transition. The, name, the, the, the late 19th, 20th century going into this century mm -hmm. for many thinkers, including Nietzsche, is something where something has ended, mm -hmm. something has come to an end, and something new is on the horizon. And the Übermensch is that bridge. The Übermensch is not, is not someone who, who comes into his own and then just stays there. But the Übermensch overcomes himself. Yes. But, 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 but so, so definitely the overcoming, but I think, I mean, Nietzsche continually overcame. He, you know, he, his biography shows him overcoming, overcoming his illnesses, overcoming his uh, maternal home where he was surrounded by all these women and, you know, you know, without getting into sort of uh, trouble with all that sort of male, female thing. But he, you know, he was, he, he lost his father, surrounded by all these very pious women, and then he overcome all this, all of that. Then he went to university, and then all the structures around him, he overcame that, and yeah. then he went wandering, and he overcame that, and all of this illness, which and obviously, ultimately, he died, of course. But, you know, he's always overcoming. And I think he is saying to all of us, you're going to have to continually overcome your past as you become. Become you know, who you are. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so I'm, I'm standing here. Has uh, he used to be a sportsman? But I have to overcome that life. And then, then the three metamorphoses, you know, that, that are in Thousand Streets, is about overcoming. You know, coming yeah. from camp to lion to child and be able to play and to create and to innocently be uncontaminated by or held back by what you used to be. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think overcoming is one of the major themes of, 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 uh, of Nietzsche. Um, I'm interested, though, what you said about eternal occurrence, because, again, doesn't it start off well, by saying, doesn't it start off by saying, imagine if someone comes to you yeah. and tells you this. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I mean, this is the problem with poetry and things, because then I just think, well, yeah, I, I take him at his word. Imagine if it was like this, how would you be? Imagine if actually you had to do this thing over and over again. Yeah. How would you be? Now, quite clearly it's a tautology because if you've already done it before, you would do what you've always done and you'd get what you've always got. That's clear. But nonetheless, he's presenting in front of us, just imagine, and are you going to be a herd, you know, slave or a herd, or are you going to be this overcomer? Yes, but also someone who, I mean, you, you can think of the eternal recurrence of the same in terms of ecstatic temporality to some degree, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. what, what has been is coming towards us. Mm -hmm. So overcoming doesn't necessarily just mean to leave behind and push aside, mm -hmm. but to turn so that what has been, what, so let's just make it personal, what you have been or what I have been, yeah. I is coming towards me and I am accepting it, affirming it, and making, as Heidegger says, and turning the next moment into a highest again, so that this moment will recur in another moment, right? An, an Augenblick, again, mm -hmm. difficult to translate, but so it's not every moment, not every second. But there yeah. will be, you know, there will be a certain kairos mm -hmm. in life. There are some true Augenblicke, some true moments that are, you know. So an Augenblick is a blink. For the English people, the Augenblick is as you blink, a blink in a blink of an eye, basically. Yes. Yeah? And that, that's, a, but in, 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 for someone like Heidegger, or Nietzsche, and Kierkegaard also, it, it means when, you know, when all of existence, when it just comes together and it begins to make sense and flourish um, mm -hmm. for, for a moment. When you have to take these moments and, and turn them into, highest cease cease these opportunities when they come a, a real genuine opportunities right not the inauthentic career opportunities and all this nonsense but the genuine opportunities and then 
that that will come towards you again. So what's coming towards you is it is always what has been. And that's, I think, part in, in the eternal recurrence of the same. That's what it, it's addressing. But that also has to, and the chapter right after this is entitled Incipit Tragedia, or um, in, in keep it tragedia, depending on how you pronounce it, which means tragedy begins or may tragedy begin. Mm-hmm. So tragedy is, the, the tragic sense is very much present there. Um, we, and that means that there is no, ultimately no resolution. There's no salvation, ultimately. That's what Nietzsche always wants to get back to, already in the birth of tragedy, is this utter profound sense of the tragic as a, a return. I think the, the Übermensch is someone who doesn't look for salvation or for you know total power over everything, but is someone who can deal with this ex- explosion of power that is modernity, because th- that's what we're living through. It's, it's, everything's powerful. I can just push a button and, and a light goes on, uh, and I click another button and I see you, uh, but you're like eight miles away from here. Uh, and, and just button pushing. I'm actually, I'm touching the will to power, right? And any second, I'm, I'm holding the will to power in my hand. Um, <laughs> this is a tremendous power that we have. Like we're holding, you know, divine fire in our hands. And the, 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 even mentioned someone, and Nietzsche says this somewhere, is der zur Technik gereifte, is someone who is ripe and ready for technology. Wow. So Nietzsche makes all of these remarks in the Nachlass, uh, and also says about the image that I sent you that, uh, it's Caesar yeah. with the soul of Christ. Yeah, no, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you, you it, but, it ha- but there is no salvation in, in the image either. It's someone who's ripe for what's coming for this tremendous explosion of power and who doesn't become, though, a destructive force. So the power's not within the Ubermensch, it's around him or what? what, what yeah, it's, 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 almost, it's through him. It's through the, I think it's, it's, it's through, not in, right? It's, it's not that, it's, it's not that the Ubermensch uh, is, is this volcano of power, but it's someone who can play with this explosion of power that we're, that, that is our epoch, an explosion of abstract intelligence, etc., without becoming a destructive force, because it's very easy to become very destructive in the nuclear age mm. Mm. oh okay so, so, so certainly de- definitely food for thought and uh, um, that let's, yeah because so how do you deal with the um heideggerian view of uh, elichtong and uh, gelassenheit and allowing the future yeah. to reveal itself and that's yes that's the exact i mean look this is the so Nietzsche says about the last man also, that's very important. Nietzsche is fearful that if, we, if, if the Übermensch doesn't come, then who will be in charge? Or, you know, just the last man, which is almost everyone. Yes. Those, those are, they, they doesn't, what does he say in charge? Those who, die, die, die Wüste bergen, der die Wüste birgt, which means someone who bears the desert within him. This is someone who only brings the desert, who cannot bring in this moment of utter destruction of meaning, actually leans into this meaninglessness and says, says, just give me my Netflix, right? Or give me my flat screen TV or whatever it is, my newest gadget, and I just lean back because I don't care uh, as long as I have my career and my enough food. Um, I don't well, mind. Not, not even the career. I mean, I mean, I mean, the, the times that we are living in, and as we as we as we record this thing, you know, we are in in, in coronavirus, COVID nineteen times. Yeah. We're all restricted to our our homes, and I've had discussions with people who said, "Well, yeah, actually, that was this, a- right. this, this 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 is fine," and it, it, I mean, people who have said. So I was speaking to a friend whose yeah. father was eighty two, and. Um, they said, if I could have another 10 years like this, I'd be happy. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is last man philosophy. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so literally, uh, 10 years where I've got my food delivered to the door. Yeah, yeah. My yeah. entertainment is looking through the screen. And the only thing I've got to do is see how I can sight by one more day. And that, that's that, that, the, 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 the total capacity of my life. Yeah to get food delivered, watch TV, and survive another day. 
and my relationships I saw you one of your podcasts where you talked about um, these people who lived in these pods and things. Yes. And my relationship is just to live in my pod, speak to people through the screen like I'm speaking to you. So I'll get my social pleasure through speaking to you. Yes. And I hop along the, and this, Lisa didn't die. Yeah. It's, it, yes. And it's, it's it, which is completely contrary to the Ubermatch who grabs hold of life. Yes. Who takes risks in life who's happy to fall off the tightrope in trying to get from A to B, who's always striving to overcome the last version and the last reiteration and what I'm taking for you and bring in what's coming for him. Or, and let me yeah. say her, it's not sexist, but bring in for them yes. what the future is drawing them into. Yeah. This projection and this um, representation. Yeah. But this is something, exactly, but this is someone who's who's given up on the fancy of happiness right as nietzsche says the last man blinks and says we've invented happiness we haven't das glück erfunden yeah which genau. is material happiness etc yeah. <laughs> which is where and you made this comment on one of the videos where you said you know, it seems like gestell has us exactly where it wants us to be which is 100 percent, johannes <laughs> yeah 100 percent. so 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 this is where i start to go into the little bit of woo woo yeah because 100 percent. so 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 one of the things that this scenario has done for me yeah it happened to me once about about two or three years ago i was driving in in um, cyprus and i bought I'd, I'd i'd hired a car in limassol i was going to northern cyprus and while i was in southern cyprus i had i had everything on my gps so i could just you know i could plot where i was and then when you cross the border into um from Augusta, that ends all of a sudden, nothing, nothing, nothing. The, the framework is not there, it's nothing. So I was driving and I was driving through the Vusta and I remember coming through a couple of bends, going through this sort of dusty town. Yeah. And there was some sheep and there was a sheep dog. And I drove past them and I don't know what told me to stop. And I stopped, I got out of my car and there was a massive fall down hmm. a mountain. Hmm. And so I, I recognise there that actually Gestell, in within Gestell, it protects us and it also gives us the framework in which we can move, breathe and have our being. Right. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I was aware of it. Now yeah. you look at this scenario and very easily you can see the Gestell, how the framework has changed, how through COVID-19, we've been told to stay indoors and the way we move and breathe and have been has been reformulated for us. Yeah. And it doesn't take the brain of Einstein to <laughs> see that the way out of this is us, the last men, shouting for the government, those who control Castell, to provide an environment in which we are injected, we are We've got our a number, and and if you go back into biblical thoughts, you know, way in which we can buy and sell and move and breed and you do all your trades, and then all of a sudden the world that Nietzsche is talking about is 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 no longer on the horizon. It's here. In order to be part of the polis, in order to be involved, you have to have your number. You can only trade by being part of the system and buying into that system. Yeah. It's very easy saying, it's, it's, it's so easy to see. Now, I'm yeah. not a prophet, I'm not saying anything. All I'm trying to say is I can just see the Gestell now is so much more obvious than it was this time last year. This time last year, I'm free, I do what I want, I fly what I want, I say what I want, I go to work. But no, now you need voucher. I'm, I'm making this up, but now you need a voucher to fly. And only yeah. very few people can fly because we can't contaminate each other. And it'd be very expensive to fly. And, you, and you'll be checked. You know, you, on, on, on your watch to start off with, but eventually you'll be checked. How many flights have you had? No, you can't go. So, so all I'm trying to say is, you can soon see how a Gestell, how a framework is created. Well, I mean, in fact, we've always had a framework. It's just, it's now much more obvious or can be seen much more obviously. Yeah, it can be seen. Yeah, this, this is what I was saying. You have to take some philosophers really literally. Because they, they see, but not for, for all that highly, the philosopher sees that that's the sense of philosophy, anyways, or hears. And then they, they, 
they describe what they see. And Nietzsche says, you know, we've talked about this, the next 200 years are decisive. Because for now, and he says this, I think, in Zarathustra, that for now we still have, we still have the soil within us to yes. give birth, to give birth to a new goal, a new what for. Yes. And he says that the European nihilism, which will reign for the next 200 years, means that there is no what for. There is no overarching reason to be, except for I'm at home, I've got my food delivered, and I have my Netflix, and I'll be fine doing this, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, the, it, for, and for Nietzsche, of course, it's, an, it's the artist uh, as, a, as a prime uh, uh, Example. exemplar exactly yes and but he and he says something in the Nahlas which is also striking about the european man he says right what well, what about what about a european human being what 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 are they like well they're very interested he says very interested indeed however only epidermally interested so nothing goes through their skin everything becomes interesting he already sees this in the 19th century right everything is briefly interesting and yeah but but nothing is right you know we, we could oh nietzsche's theory of nihilism is rather interesting yes well but you know but it's not a theory like if you take it literally then we are living through this hellscape of meaninglessness um which 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 we won't get out of if we don't set another goal that's actually higher than what we've been given over the past what, 50, 60 years or so. So, 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 so when, when you talk about Nietzsche talking about that sort of very thin veneer of, of, of intellectuality, uh, I'm assuming, you know, in his time, he was talking about the proliferation of newspapers and magazines and people, you know, would, you know, and, and what, what, what Heidegger talks about the Gureda, everyone was gossiping, everyone was reading. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, people were created for society and you matriculate at 21 and rush into work as opposed to what he'd want where you know you take 30 35 years you know when he when, when he when he castigates jesus and nazarene his castigation was because he he, he started his work too early <laughs> you know that actually he was only he should only just been beginning in his 30s 35s to do something so i think it was well i mean you correct me you you're, you're, a, you're a scholar you're a professor but you know it was a very this magazine sort of culture which of course 20 years later we still very much have yeah you know, in fact now it's gone from magazines and newspapers to, to twitterverse yeah and 100 characters yeah. and yeah. and within a space of a week i know all there is to know about whatever there is to know in my 140 characters yeah, yeah. And, and 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 whereas he said no no yes. no 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 and to read me you need to read me come on yeah, sorry, but exactly, but you know, and, and, and what we do while we read, you know, either the newspaper now, the, the Twitter feed or the news feed, is we're always evaluating and always judging. Right? So we're always blinking and, and looking and looking at this uh, like, dislike, up, down. It, it's a constant judging and evaluation of everything. And that's what Gestell needs. It that's what this is what this unhomely or making us homeless. Uh, wheel work needs it needs to evaluate itself and needs us as evaluating machines uh, that that's what keeps its um, its algorithms going so we're always blinking <laughs> scrolling through it's like like this like up down and uh, of course it's a play with fire right and I've, I've, I've been saying this publicly many times now that also what I'm doing is, is I'm playing with fire because it could be that, that, that all, all I'm doing is just feeding the machine too, um, with without uh, without maybe bringing anything across. And it, it can be very just you know on the effective level. So um, one still has to read philosophy. One mu one mustn't just listen to podcasts. One still has to. I think it's very important that we go back to reading and literally you know proper reading, sitting down, taking notes, etc. With a, with an actual book also very often. Yeah. Um, and this kind of you know and this you know making we're always in terms. Of, this valid the validating validating process that's what the blinking is that's what happiness is you, you're happy when you get a like etc uh and so we're 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 living in this you know, bit of a, a weird time but for nietzsche the response is the the willful uberman who taps into this explosion of power and can artistically and creatively turn this into something 
greater, into a higher goal that, that's going even beyond themselves, right? Into something that actually taps into the meaning of history, for example, and brings stories and brings philosophy and brings um, poetry to the world. That, that, that he, wants to, he wants to be pregnant. He wants people who are pregnant with, with meaning. To, to give that to the world, to birth a new star, as he says, and you like to quote that one. Um, and then Heidegger's response, because you mentioned it a couple of minutes ago on Gelassenheit and being released or being, mm -hmm. yeah, released maybe is a good word, um, is, is a bit different. Uh, it, it's not tapping into the explosion of power. It's, he, for Heidegger, it's, it's, about, um, it's about denying the will. It's about will will re re refusing the will its force and thereby letting this history of being run its course while another is beginning because he sees no possibility to be within gestell as it were uh and and purely affirming it and its power circuits but instead we have to step out of it let it run its course and without any willful action, be released and let into the world okay. as mortals. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so. I mean, obviously, that's this is all about my about my page right now, um, because so, so, so. My understanding was that as you move towards something, so, so. I mean, you know, as you as you work and you move towards something, something yeah. comes towards you. And you only get the tip of the iceberg. Or you only get the, you only get what you know. But you keep working with that, and more gets revealed as you start working towards wherever it is you're going. And you yeah. know, when I think of all the iterations I've had in my life, uh, they've always started off very, very. Uh, I mean, only seen a little bit of whatever it is, the little opportunity, the little thing that was there whether it was as a sportsman starting off, whether it was as a, a speaker, whether it was a team, a little bit. But then in going towards it and fastidiously working towards it, yeah. more of it was revealed until all of a sudden, I'm enveloped inside of it. it, 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 it then whatever it, I become, it becomes part parcel of my Dasein. Part and parcel of, of, of who I am. So, so, so not like now, as I begin my journey, my philosophical journey, you know, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm very much aware of the horizon that's coming for me, the ultimate, the, the, the death. Yeah. You know, I've got 20 years. As I stand here, I know the me that's here will be very, very different to the me that's approaching those 20 years. And even if, if all my philosophy is to do is to enable me to embrace the encompassing of death in a what do I want to say to embrace the to not fight death yeah but to lean into it and embrace it I mean Heidegger talked about the impossibility of any more possibilities but yeah. to embrace it as the of the encompassing of my life because that's another thing you you, you, you know you learn that whatever you start dies whatever you start uh, uh, and you said this once you said um i think you said uh, on one of the otium lectures that cicero says you lead your life thinking to learn how to live yeah. only to recognize that actually you've been living your life learning how to die and i guess that's what i'm trying to say now we're about the death is that the the, the, the glass of the, what's what's coming towards me and I'm, a, and I'm seeing tips, it's obviously that final horizon, yeah. but I want to do it more with skill and with passion and et cetera. Yes, it's, it, Hölderlin, as you know, very close to Heidegger's thought, says, mortals die their death in life. Rilke, another philosopher who mm -hmm. Heidegger reads when he was very young in Marburg, says that death is our friend. Death is, our, your death is your friend. And, and yes. you have to have well, a relationship. Yeah, you have to have a relationship with your friend. And that's what it means to become an adult. Mm. So what we're having is if we don't have uh, a, a community of people who have a relationship with their death in this profound manner, then we have only children running around. 
and never adults who face up to, um, we have a deathless world, a world without death, but that's a world that's, that's not, that misses, right? Everything actually, and is very clear because death is the other side of being. It's mm -hmm. always okay. already there. And Heidegger would go very far. He says, you know, mortals uh, dwell in death. And he struggles with it. One, some of the last words he writes down is actually on the last written words by Heidegger is, is a question that is very short no because he was very old and very frail at the time. And he writes, it, will it be possible in, in the world of technology, the world of Gestell, for human beings to have a home? So we're back with you know, the unhomely. Mm -hmm. But then he also writes a, a, a short piece for himself, which was then published posthumously for a student who became his friend and then died suddenly after his last visit. And he says that this sudden pain of, of, a, of a student dying, and it must have been, he says, horrible for his family. That turns over from within itself into gratitude. It, it turns, it, it becomes gratitude. But only if, only if death is welcomed into existence, yeah. then the death of someone is the sheer gratitude that someone was, and we're back to Dasein, there. Yeah, 100%. And it's, it's, it's so beautifully put because um, when some, I mean, look, I haven't gone from that, like when my dog died. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to, but, 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 but when, my, when my dog died, it's exactly, exactly that. Actually, my dog who, I mean, I live on my own, and, and, and my dog who was my beautiful partner, and when he died, a part of me died with him because what I had with him, I can never have again. So, you know, so, so part of my Dasein, was encompassed in the relationship that I had with him on a daily basis, walking in the park, going in the woods, the sights and the smells, watching him do his thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it also reminds, so, 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 so that part of my relation of my life is gone. But in it going, you are right, I am so grateful that I had it, because it also then tells me, guess what? You are also going to go and what you've experienced with him, others, my children, will experience with me. And this is the, the wheel of life, that this uh, holding on and letting go. And that if we never ever face the reality of death and the pain of death, yeah. it's really difficult then to embrace the joy of life. Yes. Oh, that, 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 that. Well, that's it, the vitality of, of, of life. And so, um, yeah, it's great to grapple with death. And yet, all the, you know, whenever we have something you know, about a, a couple of scares, it's a make I talk about death. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you, uh, you, know, you get that emotional, when you think you might face death, and you think you're prepared for it, but you get that emotional something that comes up inside of you. Oh my gosh, the reality that I might no longer be here. And that's not a nice feeling. And yet, I would hope that if you were living with that feeling, you then somehow make it friendly and, 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 and embrace it, knowing that, hey, there's no choice, A, there's no choice, but yeah. there's something new coming, being birthed in you, even in that death. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's that, maybe one could say, it's this intensity of death that, that it is, right? Which is why it is a taboo, uh, mm -hmm. taboo is, means intensity something was a place where we shouldn't go but it's, it is this intensity and it's not just you know focusing on death and, and and thinking and talking about death all the time being obsessed with it no but to is to cultivate a, a friendship with with death perhaps what what Rilke means is to cultivate a friendship with this impossibility this impending impossibility of my being there that this becomes not a, not, a, not a simple fact, you know, not, not a sheer reality, but that it becomes 
um, a, a possibility that, that, that can be welcomed. And that's when, that's when if death with Rilke is the other side of being, then that's when wholeness sets in. Right? That's, that's when wholeness becomes possible. And you, you said there's, there's a weird joy that comes with it. Mm-hmm. Because it is also, I think it's ultimately the joy also of letting go. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 and also on some level to, to leap, leap back. And Heidegger says this once, right? We look at the tree. What do you see? Are these neurons shooting around? Are these just uh, atoms, physical particles? Or let's just leap on the soil on which we stand and die hyphen if we don't kid ourselves That's and he says and introduce ourselves to the tree just to see the tree and the tree introduces itself to us i mean this i think this is what you described there is this this leaping back on the soil being all of a sudden this is releasement right? being released into the world again yeah so i love the idea yeah. of the joy of letting go i i i i, I love that because um Again, I think, you know, we, we, we have that throughout our lives, you know, so I'm 60 odd now and yeah. I've let go of a lot of things. And there is a beautiful piece when finally you can just stop striving, uh, you, you know, when you've, you haven't got to prove anything anymore. Yeah. And you've, you've just actually the joy of just enjoying the, the, the moment that is. And I, I, I obviously I don't know what it's like to die, but I, I assume that there comes a time or I would hope there comes a time when you get to that moment when you just think, you know what, I've, that, that was a beautiful, and, 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 and then back to Nietzsche, you can go, was that life? Once again! <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, but that's, that's what he says. Yes. If that's life, then once again! <laughs> yes, but that's what, this is, this is what, this is why it's, what he says in the beginning of Sarah's Russo, and he says to the, the tightrope, the, 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 what's the word? You're talking about tightrope walker, yeah. Tightrope walker, yeah. He says, <laughs> there's, not, there's nothing above you and nothing below you. You're just, you're just dying. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. Very, that's, that's, that's cruel, but it's, it's, it's exactly then where you have to come back to say, can I live this life again? Yeah. Again and again. Yeah. Right? And, and is it worth my time to kill it, to kill time? Or is it actually necessary? to live up to what it means to be a human being, right? There's a responsibility. As Ivo De Gennaro says, it's not a fact, it's a job, it's a task. There's a responsibility that comes with being a human being. You don't know what it is yet, but you have to find it. You just don't take existence as a sheer fact, right? You you started this conversation by saying the amazement of that I'm here, that there is something, which is, as you know, that's the beginning of philosophy. Thomasin is the, the Greek word, to be amazed by to feel a sense of wonder that there is something rather than nothing that's the metaphysical question in a nutshell is why is there something rather than nothing you're already in thinking that's when thinking begins because if not without this you're just in chaos you're just scattered and i think often you know we live in just a chaotic you know it's perfectly ordered by gestell yes, yes but it's actually chaotic because there's nothing holding it together. Yeah. What, what, what holds something together and lets meaning arise is that beings are, as Heidegger says, in the whole. Beings light up as wholeness, not as you know, scattered things and something over here and something over there that can be easily replaced, etc. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's, that, 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 that's, that's great. And uh, like you said, there's um, nothing holds it together. And again, I think that's exactly what we've seen here in yeah. uh, it's these times now, these times, you, you know, if you transport yourself back to January, yeah, we were making our resolutions, we had all sorts of plans, and, and you know, 2020, you know, a new decade, and you know, we there was no, no perception that within three months, all the world as it was, there's nothing holding it together, it's all a contract. It all depends on us believing this, believing that. And within seconds, it's falling apart. Yeah. Nothing holding it together. I mean, that, that's beautiful. So, sorry, there's something else you said when you were talking. 
and there's some, so, so thank you for this opportunity. But there was, um, I was thinking of Sarah Susta, who, who stands on a mountain and he sees the sun and he says, and he says, oh, you know, I'll see you again. And what would, what would life be for you if I wasn't here to, you know, take of your wisdom, and take of everything that you give me. And then, you know, now I've got to go back down there because I'm, I'm dripping full of all this wisdom. But again with this, the thinking that every day for 10 years, the sun comes to him and, and he sees that it's coming for him and giving him the, the, the wisdom. But it does go down. So again, that like Uber and Runta, yeah. over and down, and it comes back again. So again, thinking about what you're talking about, that it, whether there was something for Nietzsche and Thalassusa in that eternal return of the sun, that it looks like it's dying, it looks like it goes away, but actually it does come back with more goodness in exactly the same path and with more vitality yeah. and more information. Yeah. And so now knowing that, I've got to go and let these people know there is an overcoming and a downgoing. Again, I don't know, as I said, you know, I'm very much an amateur philosopher. I, I, I love what I'm reading, but it's, it, it's all very new to me in the last two, three years. And, and, and it's, it's me grappling with, more with my Daza, my being in the world, me grappling with Dasman and the way everybody else affects my being in the world. Yeah, but very often coming like that to philosophy, especially philosophers like Heidegger and Nietzsche, means that there's, you know, it's, it's um, the access to it is more, almost, I think, often more serious, yeah. because there's more of an openness to taking it literally. And what is it that they're telling us about our age, instead of, you know, reading it as a career, or out of academic interest by finding, you know, something you can hear at every, every single Nietzsche talk is, I think there's a tension in Nietzsche. Well, yes, of <laughs> course, there's a tension in Nietzsche because he's working through every single, con not every single, but, you know, all the many yes. contradictions of metaphysics and of Christianity and of the moral system that we've inherited. And he says in the Saratustra, dangerous is it to be an heir because reason breaks out in us, but not just reason, but also unreason, irrationality also is breaking out within us. And this is, and this is again, this prescient prophetic tone that he has sometimes where he says the, these coming centuries will be centuries of utter rationality you know calculation etc but also irrationality at the same time always an interplay and cannot be discerned. this is why heidegger then just to make this make make this comment very briefly heidegger will say we have to move beyond these dichotomies we have to move beyond subject and object we have to move beyond rationality irrationality because they will always flip back and forth. There, there, there must be something else, which is the simultaneity of, for example, concealment, unconcealment. Mm -hmm. that, that any enlightenment bears within itself darkness. That any, right. any, any, any disclosure is already guided by concealment. Actually, he will go as far as saying that, you know, clearing, clearing itself is for concealment. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, I mean, that's how every every contract and every magician yeah. works by yeah. revealing something which kill, conceals something. Yes, it's quite clearly when you're looking at this, you're not looking at what's behind it. You're looking at this. Yeah, and you you can also see this with uh, Turner, who um, you know could paint the way he did because he understood light, which means when you look, for example, at the painting as the Batamir Lake painting, or what he paints is darkness. And then one ray of light hitting that lake. Yes. Uh, and so he, this, and this interplay, that's very much uh, Renaissance, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, who was one of the co-inventors of perspective, perspective in painting, um, and, and perfected it. it, it he understands this play of light and dark. You, you get notions of that in Jung with uh, the shadows that we have within ourselves. And you, you get this to certain degrees again back to death. Death is, this, is the utmost shadow mm -hmm. of us. That, that if we don't phase up to it, 
come back to haunt us. Out of nowhere, absolutely. And, as, and my, my career as a speaker, <laughs> definitely the speaker, it is that play of, of shade and light. Shade and light, laughter, and then pathos, you know, sort of like, like darkness. And um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's. Um, yes. we, we're playing with this, right? Where we go. Yeah, we, the, yeah, yeah. Where we, well, go, into, where we yeah. go into the public because people think, oh, I know this guy. He's my friend. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just an avatar on the screen for you. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you, even if you hear my voice every day in your earpods, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's very, and, and, and being a public figure, you yeah. are very public in the UK. People yeah. know you're on television, you're on the telly, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, which is neat to say, to call yeah. it telly. Um, it's, it's, you, you, people, <clears throat> one can't, we can maybe even confuse ourselves with, you know, with the public figure, but there's always this, back and forth yeah yeah no no no, no doubt no no well, in fact, that's, no doubt you know i've made a living by being this gregarious in your face pump it up sort of guy <laughs> but that guy actually conceals this sort of person that really is grappling with what is actually going on around here <laughs> you know what is this all about yeah you know who am I, how do I to live? And I think, you know, what Nietzsche did, he released me from just surviving, creating an avatar, constructing something that is acceptable to a demographic. Yeah. To daring to tap core resources, core values, and face that chaos inside of you. And face the, maybe even potentially, the death of that social construction that's done so well for you in order to live a life before you die. Yeah. Uh, and that's really, uh, it's really powerful that he did that. One of the things that always got me with him though, he said, he said, he said that, that you should, that man should die. Oh, I'm thinking the same. But you, man should die on time. You die at the right time. <laughs> die at the right time. And I wonder to myself whether he died at the right time, or whether he would have preferred to have died 11 years earlier, or whether he would have preferred to have finished his nachlas and not allowed Kotzlitz and his sister to do it. You know. Yeah. So, so he, even great men, and Nietzsche, by any stretch of imagination, is a great man. Yeah. Sometimes don't live according to their to their truth, because I don't know about you, but I don't think he died at the right time. I I, I think I think he's half a dozen years stuck up in that heart and being a vegetative being state, male, yeah. 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 Yeah, people can't see him. Is he quite, died at the right time? It is sad. It's 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 very touching when you think about this. Eleven years, but he ultimately he suffered from his own thinking, his own yes. thinking. Because when he says, right, that he is a, he, he became a fate and he lived through him. If you, so you can always take oh, him, goodness. as if you take him seriously, he says, I'm, I'm reverting Platonism. Mm. I mean, can you imagine, when you, when you, you know, and Platonism isn't a theory. It, it's, it's how the, the Occident, the West, and then Christianity made sense of the world. Mm -hmm. in a simple form you know, there's a world of ideas and universals yes. and particulars etc and, and he's reverting this and he says you know if if this world has disappeared then and he suffers then what is there still there's nothing left he suffers through this utter loss 100 percent. So, so 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 i mean this is again why i get frustrated when i hear people just saying syphilitic 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 no yeah but they've moved on from that yeah, well, it's something I hope so. else now. It's something else now. But, 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 but when I think of him alone in his cave, whether he was up in Sils Maria or down yeah. in Genoa, yeah. alone in his cave, battling with monsters, with the dogs <laughs> barking in the night, and all of the different schisms that he actually fought with, 
And if he sees right and then, one minute he's the Christ, next minute he's Dionysius, you know, in the next minute he's the crucified one, next minute he's Avanad, then you can see that actually he turned in on himself. He, you know, all of that intellect was fighting inside of himself to try to grapple with his massive ideas and no one to share it with. Quite clearly, you know, as I said, the Pauline scripture says, too much thinking makes you mad. Yes. Too much thinking maketh thee mad. And you can see how eventually there was nowhere to go. Yeah, that, that Dionysian spirit had to, in the end, implode. You know, this guy's been thinking since he was five, since he was 10, <laughs> since Forta. You know, he's, he's, all of this massive body of work. Uh, you know, there, there's no way that, that a man could, could, you mean, could, could keep that tension inside of himself. Yeah, and this is this is what Dijanawa said about uh, about um, uh, Heidegger too. That Heidegger has this period where he writes for ten years on his own, not not for publication, this in order to, because he he stumbles upon something which is called Ereignis. Again, another word you can't translate. Yeah. Um, and then he's he's falling. Down, he calls it the unsupported, unsafeguarded, and then he's trying to find something to hold on to, which is he finds in in writing for 10 years to himself, right? And so these, these are these, so you see the, com the complete difference to the, to the academic game now. 100%. It's never, never about this, but you see someone like Nietzsche and even someone like Hegel. Hegel wrote his, of course, someone like Hegel, right? <laughs> the, prophet, <laughs> the, prof the prophet of spirit. He wrote his, he completed metaphysics in the science of logic with, when he was a school headmaster. So he, he was an administrator and teacher by day, a father then in the afternoon. And by night he wrote, just, you know, <laughs> wrote the completion of metaphysics. Not, 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 the, not the smallest task, yeah. um, but he, he performed it quite well. And, yeah, 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 yeah. and this, so, yeah, but and that's ultimately, obviously, you know, the, the level to which philosophy should aim to. That, that's what it should aim for. To write books like like that, or or pro, 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 give birth to stories like that. Yeah. Wow. Well, that, that, that's a, that, that's a massive, massive goal. I mean, <laughs> I, but philosophy for me is about working out why I'm here and how should I be. You know, and you, you know, and I want I want my philosophy to be every day understanding of 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 of, of Darzai. But you know, but someone without bigging you up, but you know, someone like yourself maybe. You know, you're young enough, bright enough, steeped in 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 philosophy enough, with you know, right from pre-Socratics to to person, to be able to to find your own niche, to find to find your own nook, to open up your own vista, to 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 really leave something in the world. I don't think that that's definitely not my calling. You know, my calling I think will be much more in understanding myself to help others understand themselves in that yeah. in that Socratic dialogue in that sort of coaching way to help people deal with the conundrums of life. But yeah, you know, your, your, your Kants and your Hegels and your, your, your Nietzsche's and your Heidegger's and, and these massive, massive minds who spent all of their time really nailing down a massive metaphysic. I mean, that's just... Yeah, and, and they had to, right? That, that's the thing, there's nothing that, that they weren't told to. They, no. it, it came out of them. It, and yeah, it has, absolutely. Which is again, we know with Nietzsche why why he has so much derogatory to say about um, you know, the, the, the 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 professors who scribble looking to the past and negate this and support this and but have got no real depth behind themselves. You know, whether you know I've read that in the Will to Power and stuff, he's always having a, a go. Twilight Dard is always having a go at the professors. <laughs> And, so, also, and also in, in the um, uh, history as the use and abuse of history for life. Yeah, was that, was that in the, in the um, uh, Untimely Meditations? Well, when was that? The Untimely very Meditations. On. I think very early untimely on. Meditations. In the Untimely Meditations, there's a, when he has a guy David Strauss, and then the next one I uh, read before Schopenhauer's Educator, or maybe, or maybe it's even Schopenhauer as Educator, where he really lays into the professors. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he just said it when he yeah, 
when you, I think he was still a professor when you did that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, I mean, that probably comes with the profession, right? And that's, that's um, but there, there are always, there are always exceptions. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and it's actually, you know, the, in, in this moment, it's, it's easier again to be an exception uh, where in, in the academy eccentricity is no longer supported. You, you can be the more eccentric one naturally is the, the better one fair will in the, uh, you know, it, the more eccentric you are, the better you will fare by doing your own. Uh, okay. So you're saying, you're saying now as a professor, so in a university, can you be eccentric and be in a university? No, no, no I don't think so. No, not really. really? No, not really. No. Oh, so, so the, um, so the, the, the picture of dead poet society and, you know, stepping on the chair and really grabbing the kids and food for worms. You can't be that sort of professor anymore. Uh, no, I mean, you can, <laughs> but you, you, you can, but you, I don't think you will get very far. What does that um, mean? Well, the, the trouble is that before you even get to, so I still teach at, you know, at a university here. Uh, and I'm, I'm as eccentric as I want to be or as I am I, because I don't mm. care. Mm. But if I played the official academic game, which would mean to publish paper upon paper upon paper that I don't care for, you're so overworked. Uh, so if you had any passion when you went into the PhD, by the time you leave your postdoc, also you're anxious. I know people who, who tell me, when I went on the job market, I, I had anxiety attacks. I stopped eating. I, I, did, I didn't sleep for two years. I mean, look, and then they, can you imagine not sleeping and eating well for two years? That's, you, you're killing yourself. Yeah. And so you, you get, so not everyone is like this, right? Some people get very, they're lucky and, or they're really good and they get in and they, they do really well. Um, but very often it's just, there's too many PhDs. There's not enough jobs. You have to move around. You don't choose where you end up. Uh, you, you can't say this is my, you know, as Nietzsche says, place is very important. He didn't fare well in Leipzig. Uh, no. neither, neither did, by the way, Goethe didn't do well. He almost died in Leipzig when he was a student in Leipzig. It must have been about the beer and the, 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 <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 very, uh, the very lumpy German food uh, yeah. that, didn't, that didn't suit him. And Nietzsche had to be in Sils Maria. He had to be in Genoa and then Torino. That's when he comes into his own. He said, Torino, this is a city built for my soul. And he talks yeah. about just how, to, how you have to take a walk in Torino. You walk on the Portici in this manner. You don't walk then uh, and there when people are there. But so place and climate are very important. Uh, but you don't get to choose that either, where you end up. And uh, you, you, you might end up at Oxford, which is, can be nice, but can also be horrible. Because you know, Oxford is not necessarily the... the the best place perhaps um or you end up in some small town in the u.s which, which might be very nice or not very nice you, you will be very very far from home given if, if you're from europe for example um and it's so the the and by the time what i've seen by the by the time that you you get into a position where you could actually then be more eccentric you're, you've already lost it you, you've lost all this drive because it's been, it's been, you've been kept down. Uh, you kind of, you had to adapt and you're walking on eggshells all the time, right? It's like taking philosophy seriously, you're laughed at. Um, it, it, within a system. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's not, I think. For anyone, sort of, within, so within a system, a, philosoph a philosophy uh, professor can't take philosophy seriously. Very, you that's can, very often, yeah. You've got to, so, so basically there's a curriculum and year one, they need to know this, year two, they need to, you need, three need to do this, and you need to start papers and leave it at that. And then you, yeah. the next five years, you, you live the same year, every year for five years. Yes. And you, 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 you publish according to trends and fashions. And, you know, it's all evaluated again. So you publish according to impact factors and all this other stuff. Yeah. And th there was recently someone who quit... A philosophy because he said i'm just a fraud i have no interest in this and this was someone who was very honest it's it's you know there was, there was never any passion for it but he just couldn't bear doing something he actually hates mm -hmm. what, so what about so you're a private doctor, aren't you you're a private 
teach yeah, a little bit. Of... Sim, yes, yes. <laughs> I, mean, I so I teach it at, at Birkbeck. Yeah. Um, and I teach privately. Yeah. So I, I yeah. online courses. The second one this year already. A different course. Idleness before the with Deleuze and Heidegger on technology. The next one will be on Heidegger and death, I'll and then one on Nietzsche. Uh, I'm writing one on Nietzsche now for the summer or maybe early fall on Nietzsche and Ubermensch and Amor Fati and all, all the... Amor Fati, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's where it gets yeah. heavy and good. And yeah, so it's... it's, it's and I, I can know, teach you're quite, radical, you're quite radical with Amor Fati too, aren't you? You know, like, you know, that this is not a, a lovely little uh, personal development tool. No. You know, it's, it's, it's really... Heavy. It's, it's, it's heavy. heavy. Yeah, yeah, it's... it's if you take that seriously, it's, it, you, you, that what he says is that everything, that it, it, it's one with eternal recurrence of the same, right? It's everything has been necessary. Yeah. Everything up until the same. And the, one of the other troubles is um, with the academic, if you, if you create a, a job market that's so competitive, but at the same time, there's, you know, over competition for not enough roles, what you're creating is, is a precariat, and the, what a university should be is a place for otium cum dignitate, mm -hmm. where you can have an idle conversation, by which I mean a conversation that's disinterested. I have no interest, in, and disinterested in the sense of I have no interest in gaining from you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I've only an interest in the Sache, as the Germans would say, in the issue, in the topic, the question. Mm -hmm. And the question arises. And that's very, and it's, it's just a bit difficult if, if a conference is actually just there to network, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's much more honest to be a salesman than going to a conference because you're just a salesman too, but you, you're selling yourself, but not officially. Mm -hmm. So it's, but I've, I've been lucky actually, because I've, I've met tremendous, wonderful people in Tübingen, for example, Dietmar Koch was very supportive. He's, uh, he's organizing conferences that he invites me to, which are completely different. Tübingen. Tübingen. Yes, exactly. Yeah, in Tübingen. Yeah. If we're allowed to fly again, yeah. you, should, you should come in the fall. It, it'll be in German, but it's, it'll be one of the best conferences that Heidegger will ever go to. Okay, yeah. Sounds great. I'll look, look forward to it. Yeah. Hopefully we can fly. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you, Yes, no, Chris, no, no. for this. It's been fabulous. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, thank you for giving me the time and to, oh, to, hear, to hear from you. And to, I'll keep following, keep listening, keep right. reading. Yes, keep uh, reading. That's most important. More important than listening to me is reading. Yeah, I'll do both. <laughs> yes, do both. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Okay, okay.